the stakes are high, for example, when, you know, you are in front of the board, you want to become the CEO, you've got two days of drilling, stakes are high. <laughs> you know, you have been disrupted. There is a press conference. You don't know which leader is flying in mm. from a competitive company to land in the helicopter when you're about to give your press conversation, like, like literally 20 minutes before. Or everyday high stakes. I think that we hit a hundred little tiny high stakes moments every day. You know, the conversation you're about to have with someone, um, a phone call you decide to take or not. So I think there's big high stakes and then there's mini high stakes because they, they add up. Welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. In today's episode, I'm joined by Carol Kaufman, who was named the number one coach in the world by Marshall Goldsmith and one of the top eight by Thinkers 50. Carol is also a Harvard faculty member, an Egon Zenya Senior Leadership Advisor, and founder of the Institute of Coaching. Today, we're going to be talking about her new book, Real Time Leadership Find Your Winning Moves When the Stakes Are High. During the episode, Carol shares her new move framework which helps leaders move through challenges and succeed by being mindfully alert, generating options, validating your vantage point, and engaging change so that you can confront challenges the right way. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Welcome to the show, Carol. How are you? I am very good. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you for getting up so early. <laughs> right. Like, guys, it's like 6 a.m. here. <laughs> for our audience as well, and I appreciate it. How, firstly, how you been? How are you? I have been good in a whirlwind. When you're about to publish a book, mm. you know, it's just a whirlwind of activity, but it's exciting. Yeah. Does it ever get easier? <laughs> or is it the same every time? Oh. <laughs> I, I know it does. It does. Once you've been to the rodeo once, you yeah. know, the second time it's more enjoyable. You get your reps in. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. That's yeah. it, which is the core of leadership. Yes. Yes. Yeah, literally, that's what Chester, my coach, Chester Owen, who's, I know you know very well as well. Oh, Chester. He, he, yeah, I saw him yesterday. Oh, did you? Yeah, he's my coach. Look, very thankful. And uh, he's always like, it's about the reps, <laughs> getting, getting the reps in um, as well. So, so this new book, I'm really excited for it. Real Time Leadership. Find your winning moves when the stakes are high. Let's start with the, the, the title. What is real-time leadership? Okay, so real-time change happens in the now, like not five minutes ago, not five minutes from now. If you're going to change, you're going to lead, you have to lead in the moment. So the, the quote that really stuck with me was the one from Viktor Frankl, where it says, between any stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space, you find your freedom. So that space is where you're a real-time leader. And then what we try to do is expand that space, ideally live in that space, and then also though know what to do in that space. You know, it's so, okay, now I've got space, now what? So that's mm -hmm. real-time leadership is that how do you hone your reflexes enough so that in real time, you can respond in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. Where did this idea come from? Because, you know, I, just every day there seems to be another leadership book that appears <laughs> out there. Where, where, uh, did you, where did you figure out, oh, this is an area that we need to, you know, what's the inspiration behind that? What happened was David Noble and I wrote this together. David comes from the place of having been an operating executive. He was the managing partner of a strategy firm, mm -hmm. was the CEO of the world's first, you know, digital bank. So he's coming this way. I'm coming in from the background of originally a clinical psychologist teaching at the medical school at Harvard and, and becoming into leadership coaching. And we started working together and we basically, and things were happening and we're like, what is it that we're doing? Like we're doing something. <laughs> what is it? Okay. And so we sat down and really we we pulled on business strategy, military strategy, every psychological theory you can throw a stick at <laughs> and then our own experience. And that's what we found is it overcoming your reflexes is the key. And that's the real time leadership. And it's very hard to do. But what do you mean by overcoming your reflexes? OK, so let's 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 take you, for example. So the four main reflexes are fight, flight freeze and befriend. And everybody has their kind of default. 
you know, if there's a challenge, do you tend to come in? Let me mm. say, Chris, hmm, maybe you do. Um, or do you go back and you analyze <laughs> it? Do you go for the people or do you kind of do, do nothing? And we translate that into, do you force stances? So do you lean in typically? Do you lean back? Do you lean with, or are you able to not lean at all? And basically to be a real-time leader, you can do all four. At the same time? Possibly. I mean, like in the beginning of the meeting, you might need to lean in to get things going. Mm -hmm. Then when things get going, you need to lean back. Then if somebody looks shaky, you lean with. And all of a sudden at times you need to not lean at all and be with the silence to see what comes up. So in a sequence, uh, yes, you can do them as a whole orientation or as a dance. Is, is the goal then during those moments to be able to kind of step back for a second and assess and then figure out what, what, which of those four do I need to be right now? Is that really the goal to be stop and kind of catch yourself in a moment and be like, wait a minute, <laughs> let me just take a second and figure out what's, which of these four, what should, what should I be doing? What should I be leaning in right now? Should I be, is that the idea? Yes, that's what that's that's a core idea, overcoming your reflexes. And the reason we put it as lean in, lean back is it gets in your bones. Mm. So you don't have to think, oh, I should. It's like, okay, it becomes automatic. I like that. But, but wait, like it gives you a knife. Wait, there's more. <laughs> um, the other thing, and I did this recently out of desperation, um, and I'm embarrassed to say I'd never done it before, which is I had to have a really tough conversation a really tough conversation on someone who was underperforming, but I was at fault as well. It's so easy to have a tough conversation when you're like the moral high ground or you're yeah. the one opposed to you're, you're part of the culprit, which actually is the case most of the time. But I was so dreading this conversation because I, uh, long story, but I got a series of screaming texts the night before and I'm dreading the conversation. And so I was so desperate. I thought, well, why don't I use my own model to help me? <laughs> And so I, I got out literally this piece of the paper and I started writing down and using the book and I can get to it later, but one of the things is called the five C's and, and how do you do five ways to center yourself? And I went through each one and I can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. And then went into sort of the three dimensions of leadership. The first one being basically what do I need to do? And I just took myself through the model, journaled it out and felt incredibly equipped. So there is the using it in that split second moment and then using it to prepare yourself. Um, and this one was really tough because I had been extremely, uh, it, it had set me back some, some major things had happened and yeah. it was very expensive on many levels. And I realized part of me, what I wanted to accomplish is make the other person feel bad, feel as bad as I did. Interesting. And then I realized that is not what I want to accomplish. Like mm. that, and, and it really helped me because in a situation like that, we really want to convey how bad we feel and what you've done to make me feel bad. And that was like, no. The conversation went so well, it was stunning. And we, un and we uncovered the real issue. Nice. As opposed so, to going in there with your knee-jerk reaction which it would have been to, this is how you've made me feel. <laughs> which yeah, is or like, you know, could you please tell me like what went on that you could have forgotten to do blah, blah, blah. Yeah. As opposed to tell me what's on your mind. Like, You're just diffusing going. the situation as well, right? Like coming in like that. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Um, what would be another example? Because I, I love the uh, the headline, you know, I mean, the subtitle, you know, find your winning move when the stakes are high. What do you mean by mm -hmm. the stakes are high? Is there different types of high stakes? <laughs> the the stakes are high, for example, when, you know, you are in front of the board, you want to become the CEO, you've got two days of grilling, stakes are high. <laughs> you know, you have been disrupted. There is a press conference. You don't know which leader is flying in mm. from a competitive company to land in the helicopter when you're about to give your press conversation, like, like literally 20 minutes before. Or... Everyday high stakes. I think that we hit a hundred little tiny high stakes moments every day. You know, the conversation you're about to have with someone, um, a phone call you decide to take or not. So I think there's big high stakes and then there's mini high stakes because they they add up. Nice. Anytime you feel activated, yeah. either hmm, 
or uh oh, anytime. That's that is in for you in that moment. It's high stakes. Oh, I can say as a as a leader and CEO, that's every day. <laughs> I definitely have multiple moments <laughs> like that every day um, as well. Okay. So having a framework and some tools to <clears throat> assess that is definitely going to be something that's going to come in handy um, as well. Because yeah. we yeah. a lot of times we make mistakes by just reacting. Uh, Absolutely. Know. But the thing is, you know, our instincts have served us well. You react the way you do because you have great pattern recognition and you know what works 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, but 5% of the time, those reactions will kill you. Mm -hmm. So you need to be kind of what we call mindfully alert. That's the M in the MOVE move model, being mindfully alert to what's needed now. Yeah. Not what was needed in the conversation I had two minutes ago mm -hmm. or last year. What works now? Well, that was my next question. Walk everyone through the move, <laughs> the move framework, which how you kind of describe, which equips leaders to slow down high stake situations before they speed you up, which I like the way you said that. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the whole thing, remember we talked about making space. Um so one piece of it I can talk later, which is, again, learning how to settle yourself or center yourself. Okay, then what? So the the four elements are, and I'll name them, and then you can ask me which one is most interesting to you. Sure. But uh, M is to be mindfully alert. And we know what mindful is, okay, sort of able to just notice, but alert like an athlete. And then alert and agile to what? And that's what we call the three dimensions of leadership. And you want to be a three-dimensional leader, not a one or two. So one dimension is what do I need to do? Second dimension is who do I need to be? What about my internal resources? And the third is how do I interact? And we know people who are great at the do, but they run over people. And we also know people who are great at the relating, but they don't hold people accountable. So how do you kind of have three dimensions of leadership that you're mindful and alert? So that's M. O is to be an options generator. Um, Harvard Business Review this month has an article by us about it called The Power of Options. So first you can think grow. Okay, so we, we, we know that. This is sort of um, options on steroids. And what it is is how do you generate at least four um, pathways for any challenge? And we've touched on that. But lean in isn't just about people. Lean is about to merge and acquisition. Do I lean in? Um, what am I, you know, do I lean in? Do I lean back? Have I done my due diligence? Have I seen what's going on to, with the other company in a really smart way? Am I aware of the people issues? So this, this whole thing, it's not just about how you relate. It's also how you take on your challenge. So that's the options generator. V is to validate your view. So many of us who have become successful, we actually believe ourselves. When we think something, we think, <laughs> oh, I'm right. Yeah. But we don't validate. However, 75% uh, of business, business failures are due to overconfidence. So that's you're not validating Ooh. your reality. So, for example, let's say you're a super extrovert. You're a lean inner and your main partner is a lean backer, you know, risk, caution, whatever. You, you ignore that person at your peril. And it's really hard because they annoy the heck out of you because you're like, we can do this. And they're going, well, what about this? And what about that? Now in coaching, you teach that group how to be solution focused so that you don't annoy your CEO, but you need to validate your reality. And I can talk for hours about each one of these, but this is also where your unconscious bias comes in or knowing how your cognitive style impacts how you see reality. And then of course there's blind spots. So that's the E for validate. So mindfully alert, options generator, validate your view of reality, your vantage point. And then E is how to affect and engage change, which is okay. Now what? And that is how do you send out the right signals at the right strength at the right time and listen to the response so that you can iterate. And then all of that, how do you scale it through your organization? I so love that's that. the model in a nutshell. You just made me realize that my co-founder and I are, I'm the lean in, he's the lean out. <laughs> so I'm like going on the wild west, coming up with these crazy ideas, innovation, running. And he's always like, let's take a step back. <laughs> let's assess where we are. He, so there's no surprise there that I manage sales and product and he manages operations, finance. 
uh, budget, budget. Uh, budget yeah so i'm glad that we're, we've got the right positions in in the business as well and, and we're a good team in that sense and we always talk about that we we wouldn't work without each other like the business needs both um, yep. um as well so yeah i love that but a, but a lot of times you know people in you know compliance and the legal team etc the people whose job it is to keep you safe get devalued or yelled at and if they if they can change how they frame their issue, mm. they then can be listened to. But yeah, you you overlook those people at your peril. Yeah, no, I definitely don't take Shane for granted. I could not. I always say to him and the team, I was like, Shane doesn't get his. You know, I I, I kind of get the recognition because people see the sales, they see the what I do is cl- very public and client facing. Whereas all of the mm-hmm. amazing work that he does in the background, none of that's possible. Without That's right. what, what, the foundation. Yeah, the found exactly the building the foundation. So I always make a point to say we could not do what we do without Shane, the team, the producers, the operations team. Like none of none of this works without that part. Yeah, but yeah. like you said, no one sees that. Um, That's right. And then when you thank them, people think you're being nice. It's like no, you don't get this. It. Not being nice. <laughs> from, I would be drowning. Yes, a hundred percent. You mentioned earlier the um, the five C's. I don't, oh yeah, I don't want to forget that. This. Yeah. I love the five C's. Now, this is uh, taken from a colleague of mine, Richard Schwartz, who um, he comes from a therapy background, but it's called internal family systems model. And it's how we all are like have multiple parts inside of us, but we have a core wise self. So how do we know we're operating in our core wise self? And that's what we call the five C's. So you ask yourself, you know, how Calm am I? So the five C's are being calm, clear, curious, compassionate, and courageous. So if we go back to my desperate moment with my pad before this meeting where I was partly in in the wrong and I'm dreading it, sit down and say, okay, how can I be calm? Because if I'm calm, I can do the other things. So for me, that core one is calm. For someone else, the core one is compassion. It's like they come in contemptuous and it's like, I'm not getting anything done if I'm a contemptuous headset. So I got to break that. Mm -hmm. So, but for me, it's calm. So I would just think about breathing. What can I do to kind of downshift? A lot of times I'm just like a race car and like downshift, Carol, downshift. And that will help me get to calm and then think what's going to get me off calm. So that's one. Then clear. All right, what is it? Now, if I'm in a heat of a of a situation, I can like know I have a point, but I just can't remember what it is. And so I will sort of just jot down what are the most important things for me to stay clear on, what's going to get me off clear, what's going to get me back. Then curious. Curious turned out to be a big unlock in this one. Because it's like when someone's really mad at you and they're going like did 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 about the last thing they expect is when they're done with that wave, you ask them for more. So I'm like, no, what else is going on? You're not being defensive, you're sharing. So stop thinking you're defensive and defending yourself and start thinking, I need to know more. So what else about? Okay, so you lean in with gentle curiosity. And then there's compassion. It's like, I have my story, thank you very much. Um, But let me go over the bridge to where you are, see the world as you do. And then I come back, step backwards over the bridge and see how far do you come with me. And then really getting somebody else's perspective is very helpful because you can think you've been clear, but you're only <laughs> clear when the other person thinks you're clear. You're 100%. not clear because you think you're clear. I've made that mistake then, many times. <laughs> uh-huh. And then just to be courageous, which is to really remember, yes, you may have been in the wrong, but you have important points and things to say as well. So those are the five C's and we need we, we need one. So you can literally before a meeting, you can go, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how calm am I? So we had one guy, scale of one to 10, I'm always calm, uh, clear, always. And then we get to compassion. Mm, not so good at that one. <laughs> and and so yeah. this guy was about to walk into a meeting where his CFO was about to leave because of his father having a terrible illness. So this guy walks in, had asked himself about compassion. The CFO starts crying, and this is not a crying business, you know, industry. And because the CEO had just been primed, He went over, sat next to the guy, put his arm around him and said, we've got your back. And it just changed the tone of the whole company. And then it rippled out. But it was because he asked himself that question. Mm -hmm. Love it. 
that was that's so practical as well, right? Just having that in the back, those these things as toolkits in your mind before you go into particular situations and yeah. ar- arming yourself. Yeah. What would you say, like, yeah. you've worked with so many leaders, right? What would you say is uh-huh. the area that, that, that you see that comes up the most that they find challenging? Is there something in particular that you see is, is they find more difficult out of those? Well, there's there's the big moments, like, you know, when you have to get in front of the earnings calls or a big, big one for people. Mm-hmm. You know, there you are you're in front of the, you know, investors, you're in front of the press and everybody's like, you know, ready to pounce on you. So that's <laughs> a biggie. But the other ones, really, a lot of my work, I wind up doing a lot of advising about how to have conversations with their team. It's the close-up and the personal, I think, that that tends to be the toughest. So I had one guy who's got, um, he's a CEO of a, of a company, and he's got one kind of superstar there, but he says he's not adding any value. And, and you know, and so, you know, at this point in the meetings, like, I just work around him. And I'm like, Okay, so he's picking up this energy, right? That you don't think he's got anything of value, even though he's like, you know, got the ear of presidents and and you're working around him. What if that um, is draining the value out of him? Like what what's going on for you? What if you're creating this lack of value? So in that case, you know, it's like, oh, so it's like a different way to think of things. So you can get triggered hot, you can get triggered cold, and big, and then little. What was the reaction? Was it, it's not me? <laughs> well, he's been in coaching for a while. Um, but, but you know, it literally had not occurred to him. And with many leaders, particularly, um, so I'd say half my leaders are like angels and half of my leaders are part devil. Um, they, they, a lot of times people refer to me because they just scare other people. Um, but what they do, very few of them, a couple, but very few are bad hearted. Most of them, they, they have this bad reputation because they're trying too hard, they're under pressure, et cetera. And the key is back to the five C's is if you can really have compassion for them and care about them, they can hear you. Um, I think it also helps, by the way, being little and tiny because I'm not scary in the traditional way until you start talking to me. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he, it just hadn't occurred to him, you know, the whole thing For of sure, what's yeah. my impact. It's like, what's my impact? And well, what if his impact was creating the very problem he now wanted to solve? Mm-hmm. Well, that's such the value of having a coach, right? Is helping you see things you can't see yourself. Something that's exactly, the chest- it was his vantage point. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny at the end of that conversation, he goes, well, Carol, like, why don't you coach me from, from like the book? How does this like do something from the book? And I'm like, <laughs> Just did cupcake. <laughs> I, I didn't even know. <laughs> didn't even realize that's <laughs> happening. Um, yeah. When you think about putting this book into the hands of leaders, what's really the one thing you want them to take away? You know, there's so many great learnings, but if there was one thing you would like, if anything, please take this away <laughs> from, from the learning in the yeah. books. In a way, it's what we just said. It's what I do has powerful impact on people. I better make a space so that I can be choiceful and lead because it will ripple out. What you emanate even ripples out. So I would say make a space, make a choice and be a force for good. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, it's interesting because we spoke off air before we got on the, and we both agree that this is such a powerful tool to get in the hands of our audience, the HR leaders. Because they're Absolutely. really at the center of this. We're working with those leaders and they're able to help ripple that, that show those ripples throughout the organizations. Yeah. yeah. And we're also writing, um, HBR has asked us to write a workbook as well. So this can really become part of a training, part of a curriculum mm-hmm. where, you know, it, I mean, it works at the top of the house, but it works in your own house. And it works at, at every level. I mean, what's wrong with, you know, <laughs> making a space, making a choice, being <laughs> forced for good? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. And honestly, as a, as a young leader, I wish I had tools like this at my hands and my disposal just to take a second to go through the five dimensions of leadership or the five C's or the move model. Just having that at my fingertips, something practical I could just use in the moment, right? Because I kind of felt yeah. like I was just riding a wave <laughs> for so many years, yeah. <laughs> trying to just figure it out. The learning, the, learning the hard way, if I'm being honest, um, yes. as well. And I could have avoided a lot of those pitfalls. 
<laughs> if I had some support and some tools. Um, and I hope others will as as well. Because a lot of it, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it is like having this at your fingertips so you can use it. So mm. I live at the intersection of sort of research theory and practice, and I'm right in that middle spot. So although I don't go on and on about the science, every single step of the way, there's a lot of neuroscience, psychology theory, et cetera, that's sort of uh, the iceberg under the water. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't spoken about that we've missed that you feel that our HR leaders need to know about, about the book that we've missed? <clears throat> I wouldn't say we've missed, but there's one question that you sort of wrote down, which is, um, if I could click my fingers and change one thing about HR today, what would it be? Yes. I think more CHROs could be CEOs. And what I would say is sort of get the finance chops down so you can do that. I think HR is a powerful strategic tool and it is not utilized as much as it could be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very passionate about that is what can you do as an HR leader to be either invited into the strategy or into the finance and, and get to be more fully utilized. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that is part of our quick fire round, which I was just about to jump into. <laughs> oh, that's a quick power round. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, well, now, well, well, you've answered one of them, but we're going to go into the rest. So I normally like surprise <laughs> people at the end of that. So firstly, you, okay. you got you got 30 seconds per question. Are you, are you ready? 30 seconds per question or yeah. altogether? Just 30 seconds per question. Are you ready? Okay. All yep. right. What are your hobbies and passions outside of your work? I suppose your work is your passion, but... <laughs> go for, go well, for. it's true. That, that, that is true. But my husband and I have some weird interests. So okay. we love prehistoric cave art. We've traveled the Ooh. world to look at prehistorical cave art, including stuff that's not out to the public yet, which, by the way, is a little dangerous to do. Um, <laughs> okay. That and we love animals. So we go on um, safaris as much as possible, but we nice. just look out the window a lot. Nice. So I'd say animals and and prehistoric art, sort of having that experience of we've been like this for 50,000 years. I mean, looking at a piece of art that's 40,000 years old is amazing. I can't even imagine, right? It's kind of take you back for a second. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, how This is an interesting one. I'll just answer you. How would your friends and family describe what you do for a living? I'm interested to know what you get, what, what, what responses you get. <laughs> Well, my, my children are both older now, and my son calls me regularly for coaching. My daughter does it. But when I was little, they'd say, um, my, my, my daughter, when she was really little, says, mommy does talking to people to make them better. <laughs> oh, that's not wrong, though. That's actually, yeah. that's pretty good description, to be fair, yeah. Um, yeah. as well. So that's good. I love the fact that, um, what, what, how, how, do you, how does that parent coach combo work <laughs> just as a parent myself i was wondering how does how does how does that work you, you do you separate in some way or you can't really separate it like how, how does that work <laughs> well it's different i remember with my son sometimes um he was up for some award and a patent he goes like mom what should i do it was really my idea blah 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 and i said okay let's be clear as your mother throw them all under the bus it was your idea <laughs> take the money take the prize yeah. and run yeah, of course. now as a coach you know the importance of collaboration and over the long run. So you really need to make space. <laughs> yeah. So I will literally, uh, my favorite is my son once we told me something, I said, don't tell your mother that. <laughs> Love but, it. But I use the, I use the, 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 I use the model a lot in, in parenting. Mm. I, uh, yeah, I, that's what, something I'm learning again from Chester. A lot of the models that I'm learning from Chester are <laughs> so relatable in both my, my no, role as a husband and dad um yeah. uh, as well yeah. so like one of the things that i do now is sit down with natasha and robin and talk about what are our three things that we're grateful for today for example yeah as yeah. part of my gratitude yeah. journal and it's really cool to see what comes up with robin and tash about what are the mm -hmm. things or what's their three favorite parts of the day you know just s s small things that just make a really big difference um, yeah, so here's one, the three dimensions of leadership. The first one is what do you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. So you walk in the room, there's a mess on the table called homework, and your <laughs> kid says, um, I want to watch TV now. Um, really think, what is it I'm supposed to accomplish in that moment? Like, just name it. Is it to get the homework done? Is it to impart discipline? Is it to help impart a love of learning? Mm -hmm. um, like, what is it? So we think we know, but yeah. if you just say, wait, what, what, do I, what do I really need to do right now? Who do I need to be? How do I relate? You know, mm. top of the house, in your house. It really, 
So yeah, it does meld together, I think, because it's a philosophy, really. Yeah, we definitely can use that as parents because our, our initial reaction is, do your homework! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and frustration. Have you ever considered uh, changing careers? If so, why? I, I yes. Um, I actually already did. Yes, uh, technically with, you uh, have, yeah. Trauma. <laughs> I specialized in trauma for many years and I, I slipped into peak performance and then went to coaching. But there's a very interesting... Um, a program called Design Your Life from Stanford. And one of the exercises is if you could not do what you are doing now at all, what what would your life be like? And then if you couldn't do that at all, what would your life be like? And it merely makes you walk through. And for me, the second career would be a talk show host. Oh, I can see that. <laughs> yep. I, see, I, I would can... love to be a talk show host. And so actually, as a result of that, I started my once a month LinkedIn at the Institute of Coaching. Nice. Because I realized that, uh, so part of me wants to be you, dear. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that when you ask that self that question, you're like, well, why can't I do that? Like the amount of times that I said to my friends, like if you had, if you knew, what's the question I asked them? I said to you the other day in our WhatsApp group, if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? Fly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the answers that they came back with, 90% of them were fully achievable. And they just, wow. they, and the only reason they didn't do it is because that fear of failure. So we had a conversation around that and it was just really yeah. like it, it, exciting. Like, cause yeah. Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, people yeah. listening to you right now should really take that one on. So, yeah. so say it again. So like you're here, I'm, I'm one of your, you know, X hundred or thousand listeners mm -hmm. and I have my life and then ask me the question again. Carol, if you knew yeah. you couldn't fail, what would you do? Beautiful. Really beautiful question. Yeah. Interested. Let us know in the comments. We're going to post this online. So <laughs> it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what people come up with. Um, who would you say is the one person in your career life that's had the biggest impact? Um, there's two, but um, if I had to pick one, it's a woman named Ruth Ann Harnish. And I was giving a keynote at the ICF, the International Coach Federation, many, many years ago. She came up afterwards and said, why aren't you the face of coaching? I said, I've been a coach for three months. This was a long time ago. She goes, that's <laughs> irrelevant. Anyway, she was my media coach and went beyond that. And five years later, she gave me $2 million to start the Institute of Coaching. Oh, wow. That's how it that happened. Wow. Yeah. And so she was one of the most aggressive coaches I've ever met, but her confrontation was exceeded by her caring and belief. So you could really hear her. So my whole way of coaching is modeled after that. And then getting that incredible, shocking gift to start the Institute. So they were actually equally valuable to me. I love it. It's like she forced your hand, but also with compassion. <laughs> like, kind of gave you like, there's no excuse now. Here it is. Go for it. Like, and with that unwavering confidence and belief. Yeah, yeah. And, compassion but, first, courage second. Love it. Love it. Last question. Um, what advice would you give to sort of those leaders of tomorrow that are listening right now? Or actually just leaders in general, I think, to be honest. What would be your parting piece of advice? I think I'd go back to what I said earlier, which I had not really put together until we were talking, which is make a space, you know, be able to choose, see your impact and be a force for good. Mm -hmm. And to realize, you know, there's something called the gorilla effect, which is... Um, you know, the joke, a thousand pound gorilla walks into a crowded bar. Where does it sit? Mm -hmm. Answer, anywhere it wants. So for every single one of you, you, Chris, and every single person listening, if you have impact on someone's finances, resources, opportunities, you are the gorilla to them. Mm -hmm. And you're always the gorilla. And so when you go, what? And wave your arms, bodies go flying. So keep remembering that and be sort of wise and gentle and realize the power of your impact because it's far greater in a way than it should be given yeah. who you are, but it doesn't matter. You are who you are to the other person and that's what counts. That's such a great analogy and something I kind of, again, learned the hard way when I became a founder and CEO of the company, I didn't realize my words have impact and, my action, and more importantly, my actions <laughs> uh, and the way I carry myself. I didn't really realize that until a couple of years into the job. Of, mm. uh, uh, to your point, because my, my words, my actions have impact on people's families, but, you know, yeah, on right. their lives, fin their financial well-being, everything as well. Mm -hmm. and, and a very, very, very last question. Where can people grab the book? 
Do they want to grab a copy uh-huh. of the book? Where can they grab a copy of the book? Okay. And and please, um, if you're in the US in particular, hardback on Amazon, I beg you, because that's what the Wall Street Journal counts and that's our goal. Um, you can do it a couple of ways. One is if you just remember the title of the book, Real Time Leadership. Mm-hmm. So Google Real Time Leadership. Remember my name, Carol Kaufman, two Fs, one N. <laughs> Google me, get in, you'll see Real Time Leadership. Then we have something called realtimeleadershipinstitute.com, too long. So just Google real-time leadership or go to rtlinstitute.com. So three ways, maybe too many. So backup plan, Google (laughs) real-time leadership. Yeah, no worries. We'll make it even easier, Carol. Those links are all below. So where wherever you're listening, uh, watching, oh, wherever there, you there are, are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wherever you're wherever you're listening or watching right now, all of those links will be in the description. Make sure you go click on there, grab a copy of the book. Um, but thanks so much, Carol, for coming on. I really enjoyed oh, the conversation. Thank you. It's always so much fun to talk to you. And I love that I learn things and learn more about my own work by talking with you, which is the ultimate compliment. Oh, no, I appreciate that um, as well. I appreciate all the work you're doing. And I'm so excited that our, to get your book in the hands of all of the HR leaders that listen to the show and all the leaders, to be honest. This is this is for everyone, right, um, yeah. as well. So yeah. and I'm excited to implement them personally <laughs> as well in my, in my own business. But look, I wish you all the best until we next week. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great and fun. 